All right, let's see how this goes. There's gonna be a fight tonight! What's going on everybody? It's your buddy, it's your pal Spaz Phoenix of the YWC Reality Check. Welcome to a new series. We have scrapped the Wednesday Night Smackdown review in favor of this. This is the Fights on Wednesday Night, my weekly or sort of weekly as I have described before, NXT and SmackDown review. Uh, I've had multiple, multiple people ask me what I think of NXT. It comes up a lot in my Q&As. Clearly, it's something you guys want me to talk about. I, uh, I'm i going to give this a shot. Um, first and foremost, i got to say thank you to my, my good buddy Sal for the new series graphic. I uh, got the idea to do this shortly before WrestleMania, and I said to him, buddy, I need a graphic for this new series the, the week after Mania, and he pulled through with flying colors. I think it looks great, uh, so thanks to him. Uh, his link is down in the box below his contact is down in the box below if anybody else out there in the youtube universe is looking for graphics or whatever go talk to my buddy sal he's good at his shit most of the stuff that you see on this channel is done by him but yes this is a thing i told you guys for a long time i was going to treat nxt like tna i didn't want to sit back and analyze it too much i wanted to again treat it like TNA, where it's fun, I can sit back and relax and not analyze it because it wasn't part of what I did on YouTube, but demand and conversation and especially, um, you see how much I get in the in the way of Ask the Phoenix and the interactions and all that sort of thing from my, uh, from my audience, so NXT has crept its way onto this channel. It is the other half of the fights on Wednesday night, along with SmackDown, which, as you guys know, airs for me here in Canada on Wednesday. I get a doubleheader every Wednesday night. It's fantastic. So, so, live on the WWE Network for only $9.99, we start the night off with NXT. NXT opens up with Sami Zayn, who we haven't seen since his loss to Kevin Owens at the last NXT special show, whatever, where he got destroyed and lost his title by referee decision. Says it's good to be back. Talks about how good it was to be on the WWE's tour of Abu Dhabi, but he couldn't really enjoy it because he all he could think about was the way he lost to Kevin Owens. Not that he's just a different guy in the ring, but he's a different guy to the friend that he's been growing up in wrestling with for years and years and years. I'm going on assumption at this point because I know a lot of people have told me that they've had a fantastic match in... Uh, a fantastic feud, rather, in ROH as Kevin Steen and El Generico. I haven't seen any of it. I won't speak to it because I'm not familiar. Uh, but if they're continuing that story right into NXT, I think that's a nice, neat little little touch where in WWE you uh, have that attitude of, you know, in WWE it's your day one. I like that NXT kind of looks beyond that. And if they get Samoa Joe, I hope they do a similar thing with him. Not going to lie. He lays out his two-part plan. His two-part plan is very simple. Obviously, he wants his rematch, and more importantly, he wants to kick Kevin Owens' ass. That's it. That's all. Nice, short, sweet, and to the point. Rhino versus No Name. And I have this because, A, um, they never say his name. They say, this young man, uh, Rhino, is doing this to his opponent. His opponent doesn't know what's hitting him, whatever. They never give him a name, and it doesn't really last long enough to matter. Two simple, like, not even suplexes, just two tosses and a gore is the end of the match. Rhino wins. Rhino grabs a mic. He wants to make a statement. He wants the NXT title. He puts Zayn, Balor, and Owens on notice. It doesn't matter who's got the champion when I've got my shot. The reality is that you're all going to meet a gore, gore, gore. Uh, fantastic, wonderful. I think it's really, really cool seeing Rhino on NXT. But for a show that is let okay, okay NX, on the NX, on the network schedule it's listed as an hour slot but you really know that NXT is like sort of a 52 minute show and in a 52 minute show we're 10 minutes in and nine and a half of those minutes have been talking um I know most people look at NXT with a different parameter than they do Monday Night Raw, but if this was Monday Night Raw and that much time was spending and talking and this much time was spent wrestling, there would be a complaint. I hold NXT to the same standard. In the first 
10 minutes of the show, 9.5 of it has been talking, and less than one minute, uh, Ry our, uh, Rhino versus No Name, um, was the only action we've seen so far. We see a promo package for Dana Brooke, who showed what she can do at the Arnold Classic, the bodybuilding, uh, some shots of her training at, at what I would assume would be the training facility, uh, some other places. Apparently she's been a referee, because a couple of the shots are her in a referee uh, top. Um, she looks impressive as hell. I can't wait for her to debut. Her ring attire is kind of awkward looking, so maybe they get her something better. But uh, she looks impressive as hell. She looks like she's built like a fucking brick shithouse, doesn't she? Um, moving forward, you know, give Divas a chance and all that sort of thing. I expect that if she's as impressive as she looks, she'll have a lot of fun on the NXT Women's Division roster. We have a replay of Owens versus Balor. Uh, Balor injuring his knee. Owens taking advantage, hitting that ridiculous pop-up powerbomb that he does, and getting the win. Uh, Owens has a post-match promo that really just consists of I won, and that's all that matters. You know, indicating he has no sympathy for the guy. Yes, I won because I capitalized on somebody else's injury, and I don't really care. Which is fine. We have Bailey versus Emma, and Bailey versus Emma has. Uh, there's been this story where where Bailey is the bubbly, happy fan favorite that Emma used to be, and Emma's come back to NXT to smack some sense into her so that you know the universe doesn't ruin her or something like that. It starts with the collar and elbow tie up, but they break it up in the corner. Collar and elbow tie up again, they break it up in the corner again. Headlock by Emma. Uh, they have a sort of a waist lock battle where it looks like both of them are going for belly to back suplexes for a while, and it, and it gets tedious. Uh, after a bit, I'm not going to lie. Um, Bailey hits a shoulder tackle. There's a leg sweep by Emma that gets a near fall. Uh, Bailey has a counter roll up that also gets a near fall. Emma hits a clothesline. Close Bailey eats every turnbuckle in the ring. Uh, Bailey, I guess, Bailey's up and makes Emma eat all the turnbuckles herself. Emma hooks in the Emma lock. Emma hooks the, in the Emma mite sandwich. I hate that. All of Emma's like cliche uh, play on word names for all the moves that she does. I don't like them. I have to call them what they are because that's what they are. It, it, it's it's as cliche as calling up the power bomb the Batista bomb. But that style of power bomb is the Batista bomb. I don't like the the Emma lock, the Emma mite sandwich, the Emma the Emolution, the uh uh, there's one other one that I can't think of right now, but it doesn't matter because after a couple of counters, we get a roll up by Bailey and Bailey gets the win. And you think she's going to get jumped by Emma after the match. Emma being frustrated that this girl that you know is off doing all these fun, silly, happy fan favorite things is winning, and that this message of you know pandering to the crowd doesn't work isn't getting through. I fully expected Emma to take advantage of that, to take advantage of that storyline when Bailey turned her back and jump her, and she didn't. So, I, I, I know it sounds strange that I'm, you know, nitpicking Emma for not being a bitch, but according to the storyline and according to what they've progressed so far, she should have. Excuse me. We have a Becky Lynch interview in the back. She talks about NXT Rival and the four-way that they had for the women's title. She wants a, a Divas shot. She claims that she's never had a Diva, or a NXT Divas title shot, even though she just finished talking about the four-way, where she definitely did have an NXT Divas shot. But she does say two cool things. She, you know, she's in it for herself. She's not with Sasha Banks anymore. And, you know, you're going to realize very soon that it's not NXT, it's NBEXT. Which is a little awkward, but, you know, if she's pumping herself up, giving herself an ego, that's great. She turns her attention to Sasha Banks, and she does say something that I think is legitimately great. She says, Sasha, you're not that bad, but you're not this good. And that will be a soundbite that will carry over until they get their match, I'm pretty sure. When they get their match, at whatever show they do, the video package that they show leading up to that match will have... <coughs> sorry. Will have that quote, will have that soundbite as a part of it, I almost guarantee it. Blake and Murphy versus the Lucha Dragons, which seems like a step down now that the Lucha Dragons are now on Raw. Kalisto and Blake grapple to start. Springboard arm drag by Kalisto, a suicide dive on both of the champions by Sin Cara. Top rope moonsault on the outside to both of the champions by Kalisto, and Kalisto rides a headlock for a bit. The champs dump Kalisto outside the ring, and, elbow, um, and you get multiple elbow drops by Blake on Kalisto. Blake rides a headlock for a good long time, and it's a headlock that's so aggressive that it's actually uh, modified headlock slams, which is a nice, neat little thing. Kalisto tries to arm drag out of it, and he gets countered back in into the headlock once again. A wheelbarrow roll-up attempt by Kalisto gets a near fall, a clothesline by Blake. Murphy rides a headlock. We're working the head. It's great. Murphy rides a headlock. Um, 
kicks by Kalisto, headbutts and kicks by Sin Cara, springboard moonsault by Sin Cara, chops in the corner by Sin Cara, a cheap shot by Blake on the outside, a running vertical suplex by Murphy, a splash by Blake, and Blake and Murphy get the win. I... I know that there are other fan favorite tag teams on NXT. I know Enzo and Cass are popular. I like them. I know the Ascension was popular. I know the Lucha Dragons were popular. I don't understand people shitting on 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 Blake and Murphy because they are an entertaining tag team to watch. And that running vertical suplex that uh, that Murphy does towards the end. I mean, the splash is a splash, and anybody can do a splash. You go up, you fall down. It's a splash. It's fine. It's wonderful. That running vertical suplex that Murphy does is a fucking thing of beauty, is it not? Ty Dillinger versus Jason Jordan is a match that I didn't even really want to write down anything about because I didn't care. But Ty Dillinger versus Jason Jordan are a tag team. They broke up. One, one of them walked out on the other ones. I don't really care which one's which. But elbows and chops by Ty, a, a shoulder tackle by Jordan, a suplex and an elbow drop by Jordan. Jordan pounds him in the back a lot, just sits there, just wailing away, throwing hands at his at his back, which is a, one way to get the job done, I guess. Jordan pounds the back. Jordan ragdolls Ty by the neck. He's got him in a headlock, but then he starts whipping him around, which is impressive looking, and it would be cool if I cared, but I don't, because these two guys are plain as fuck. I... That's not to say that they're not talented. It's not to say that they don't have promise. Please don't get me wrong. NXT is where you develop into what you are, but these guys, these guys need to do that. Uh, I have the criticism of these guys that most other people have of Blake and Murphy, but these guys are, are lacking a lot. Atomic drop by Ty, and you get a loud and a very, very enthusiastic win tie win uh, chant from the NXT Loyals. Corner 10 punch by Ty, snake eyes by Jordan. A uh, really, really reckless looking T bone released uh, suplex by Jordan gets the win. This really felt like a squash. Both guys got offense in, but going into this match, you never for a second thought that this Dillinger guy was going to win. And I say this Dillinger guy because I'm not as familiar. I just don't care about these two guys. Nothing wrong with the match. Uh, technically, um, I don't want to sound like a douchebag here, but it's a technically proficient match that I don't care about. Um, that's as honest as I can, guys. Hideo Itami versus Tyler Breeze in a two out of three falls match is your main event. And this was great. What I have written down about this match does not do this match justice, but I'm going to try. Starts off with a cup of collar and elbow test of strength type situation. Breeze hits a shoulder in the corner. Tyler hits shots. Uh, Tyler hits shots to the face. They trade stinger splashes. One guy goes to one corner. Splash. Throws the other guy to the other corner. Splash. It's, it's a little... That because they fought so many times, that that element of tit for tat, you know, anything you can do, I can do better, uh, happens a couple times in this match, and it's good. And you you can picture both of these guys, even even though Hideo Itami is the face and Tyler is the heel, so they should be asking acting differently. Both of them wanting to one up the other one, even if they're a face, makes sense at this point. They trade stinger splashes. Hideo Itami hits a knee. A knee in the gut and a kick to the gut. Hideo hits the hesitation drop kick, which is really nice. And then something that the commentators call the shotgun kick. I've never heard that called that before, but I'm going to go with that just because that's what they called it. Fall 1 goes to Hideo Tommy. Fall 2 is pretty much irrelevant because it's Breeze stalling in the corner for a while, convincing the referee that he's been knocked silly. Then jumping basically, not over the referee, but, you know, sort of scooting around the referee to get in a beauty shot and quickly getting fall number 2 for himself. Tying it up, and as the commentators do a great job of announcing, this is down to a one-on-one -on -one match. Which... Is, is what would happen when the match is tied. But uh, sometimes the commentary is a little too on the nose on NXT. Sometimes you get the idea. And I know that the commentary people are new to, especially Corey Graves, who I think is really, really good behind the desk, I should say. But sometimes they, they it, it, it sounds like they're treating the audience like it's the first time they've ever watched wrestling. Which, for some people, could be the case. And for those people, I'm sure it's great. But if it's two out of three fall match, and one guy has a fall each it's back to being a regular match, and, and there, there's no other way you can explain that. Um, mud hole stumping by Tyler, along with a foot choke, an elbow by Tyler, and a near fall. Tyler elbows the neck for another near fall. Tyler rides a headlock for a long time, hits a drop kick, knee drops to the face, Hideo Itami on the ground, Tyler Breeze, almost Triple H style, just dropping knees on his face. It's fucking great. Rides a headlock again, you know, tying it all together. 
Clothesline by Hideo and a leg sweep, a running knee by Hideo. Clothesline by Hideo gets a near fall. Counter pinning sequence is really, really good. Gets a couple of people in the crowd right up out of their seat, which is nice. Um, supermodel kick by Tyler. Tyler hits a kick to the chest. Hideo misses a hesitation drop kick. Tyler misses a beauty shot. Hideo hits a hesitation drop kick. Tyler recovers, hits the beauty shot. Tyler Breeze gets the win. This match was fucking phenomenal. As, and, and as much as there's some other questionable stuff on this show, for the very first NXT show that I've reviewed on this channel, this was a pretty damn good show. Take the, take the Dillinger and Jordan match out of there, and everything else that I have little gripes with can stay. But that match, as I say, like I say, technically proficient, nothing technically wrong with the match. But please, I'm begging you, for these guys especially, give me a reason to care. Every other match on here, I care about. I like Blake and Murphy. The Lucha Dragons are going to have a couple more matches before they're permanently on the Raw roster. The girls had a great match. Um, we're building multiple contenders for the NXT Championship. That's great. Um, you know, we had this. We have this ongoing feud with the day with Tommy and Tyler Breeze. Tyler Breeze that ended up in this great two out of three falls match tonight. But that one match right there in the middle just sort of took my enthusiasm right out of it. Not a bad show for an hour. Like I say, it's not a bad way to spend 52 minutes of your Wednesday night. Switching gears to SmackDown. We start off SmackDown with a replay of Raw, which is a SmackDown norm. We replay all the Lesnar carnage after he missed his opportunity to get a rematch for the title. Rollins comes out to start the show with J&J Security and Big Show and Kane. He, sa he says that typical wrestling line, I love it when a plan comes together, and he starts bragging about what he did at WrestleMania and how he waited for the perfect opportunity and how he's the smartest man ever and nobody, <laughs> you know, you would think listening to him talk that nobody else has ever cashed in money in the bank. His waiting for uh, Roman Reigns and Lesnar to destroy each other is a lot like Daniel Bryan waiting for Big Show and 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 Mark Henry to destroy each other. It, it's a thing. There are direct parallels you can draw between Seth Rollins and Daniel Bryan. Not saying that that makes either of them bad, but there's direct parallels, and it's good. It shows you what a great... <sighs> excuse me. It shows you what a great tool the Money in the Bank briefcase is to the holder and to the WWE storyline, uh, story progression in general. He's the new face of the WWE, that's why he was on the Today Show. He brags about how he escaped Lesnar. He jokes about how it's his first time being champion, he's not used to it yet, and jet lag is a bitch. I won't fight you when I'm jet lagged like that because you all deserve me at my best because I'm the face of the company. Look at my massive cough. <laughs> this, is the, this is the Vince McMahon attitude now. Um, he basically supports everything that Stephanie did suspending Brock Lesnar for what he did on the show. He then goes on to say that Lesnar is a crazy animal and he is a monster and he deserves to be suspended. He's interrupted by Randy Orton, who reminds Rollins about the beatdown that he gave months ago, about the beatdown that he gave Rollins when he came back, and about the fact that he beat Rollins at Mania right before he made that cash-in, so he should be the number one contender. Plus, he's owed a rematch from, like, a year and a half ago, so he's using a little bit of Daniel Bryan logic there, but I can forget it because it's actually true. Rollins says, I don't dwell in the past because I'm the future. Basically brushing off all the truth that Orton just said. I decide who my next contender is going to be and I'll make that decision on my own. Orton says, you've never done anything on your own. And then he runs down J&J Security and Kane and the big show. He says, at least show one something at Mania. And then he, he you know, he points out the, uh, the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal Trophy that's sitting at ringside for reasons. But what about Kane? What did Kane do? What does the Director of Operations do, Kane? It seems to me like you've transitioned quite seamlessly from being the big red monster to Little Red Riding Hood. I like that a lot. Kane gets pissed. His revenge on Orton is that he's going to feist the big show right now. And if you win, the Authority might consider you as one of the potential contenders to Seth Rollins' championship somewhere in the future. Orton and Big Show is happening right now. They start throwing punches. Show works over Orton's midsection for a moment. Orton takes down the Big Show, hits the suspension DDT off of the top rope on the Big Show, which is impressive looking on its own, but that's the cue for the rest of the Authority to come in. Beat down Orton. Orton obviously wins by DQ. Orton breaks out of the mess, hits a Thez press on Rollins, but that's not that's about all he gets because Kane comes out, choke slams Orton, Ryback comes out for the save, he takes out J and J security, RKO to Mercury, Shell Shock to Noble, RKO to Kane. There's the end of your segment. Um <laughs> <laughs> the the authority without Triple H sort of lacks the, the punch 
uh, the, 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 the presence that uh, they have when Triple H and Stephanie are there for sure. We replay Sheamus's return. We announce that we are not going to get the tag team match that was announced on Raw that would have been Ziggler and Brian versus Sheamus and Barrett because Ziggler was taken out so violently by Sheamus. Now, here's where I will say that they hiccup a little bit because they announced that tag team match after Ziggler was attacked. So surely they knew he was d damaged at the time. Why would they bother making the tag team match in the first place? But be that as it may, Brian versus the new heel Sheamus tonight is your main event. They replay the Rock and Ronda Rousey moment from WrestleMania, which is wonderful. Natalia and Naomi have a match, and it's awkward, and it's a botchy mess, and Naomi wins for virtually no reason. Uh, the Bellas on commentary was more entertaining than this match, and it's not for lack of trying on Natty's part, because Natty was really trying in this match. I will give her that. This, the, 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 the blame for that mess rests solely on the shoulders of Naomi, who thinks she deserves a Divas Championship match. Dear God, no. Just saying. Roman Reigns has an interview with Byron Saxton in the back, talking about WrestleMania, talking about all the uh, all the abuse he suffered at the hands of, uh, of, of Brock Lesnar, and all the abuse he put on to, on to Lesnar uh, right before he was going to win, and Seth Rollins stole it away from him. He doesn't really insult... Uh, Rollins, he he says that it was a heartbreaking moment. He says that it, it it was you know it was deflating and it was sad and whatever. And he knows that he can beat Rollins somewhere else down the line, and he's gonna do that. It, it it's you know no t you know one must not mourn forever. We're gonna move on. <coughs> Rollins is the champion. I'm gonna take him out now instead. Uh, but he doesn't really shit on anybody. He gives Lesnar the credit he's due. And he kind of has the same attitude that most champions have after a Money in the Bank cash in. It's like, hey, he can do that. He he earned the he earned the title. He earned the the opportunity to do that when he won Money in the Bank. Um, and a lot of people will say that that's a Cena type mentality. Whereas if he sat there and bitched about it, he would sound like a bitch. Uh, whereas it's like, no, it happened. Fuck it. Let's move on. And. Um, you know, he talks about, he, he, he doesn't, how can I say this? He doesn't say that he didn't fail, because he knows he failed. But he still is, in his own way, able to be proud of the effort he put forth at WrestleMania. And I think that is, I think that's good. I can't really, I can't put into words why I think that's good, but it is. If he just sort of shriveled and, oh my god, I suck, look at how much I failed, that wouldn't help his character at all. So I, it's, it's good to see that he can be proud of his efforts and know how close he was. The, the, the bulk of the interview was about how close he was and, and getting that close and you know being at the mountaintop and being pulled back down again, that sort of thing. Miz versus R-Truth is a nothing match. Uh, there's a caller and elbow tie-up. Um, what the hell? I can't read my own writing. There's a collar and elbow tie-up that leads right into a headlock by The Miz and, and a quick knockdown. One hip toss by R-Truth and a spin kick and a splash is countered by a kick in the gut, an immediate skull-crushing finale, and, like I say, a one-minute win by The Miz. Miz is celebrating. He gets a skull-crushing finale from Miz Dow, who sneaks up from behind and steals Miz's glasses on the way out and does The Miz... Or, sorry, The Miz Dow pose and gets the crowd all up and going. Everybody's happy. C... We wouldn't have this to look forward to if they had spent their load at WrestleMania. Just just putting that out there. Cena comes out and cuts a really good promo. I'm not going to lie. He comes out with the title. I don't know why he comes out with the contract that he and Rusev signed for WrestleMania. Because at no point does it become part of his promo. But he comes out with the belt and he comes out with the contract that he and Rusev signed. Talks about Mania. Talks about some typical Americana bullshit. Shows Rusev the spec that he deserves. He says, I'm not out here to hate Rusev because he's from Russia. I'm not out here to say that he's not a great uh, athlete and whatever. I'm here to say that w the way he treats America and the way he talks about America is bullshit. And that that is sad because Rusev is the American dream. You know, somebody, an immigrant coming over and making good in America and all that sort of thing. He's the, He is the American dream, but he wastes it. Which I think is a really cool thing to say. He goes on a, on a, on a tangent about the Statue of Liberty. And, uh, again, it's more Americana stuff, but at th in this point, it becomes less cliche, and it does make a little bit more sense. He talks about the title re representing America, and America representing opportunity, and, um, 
the quote that I believe is written on the Statue of Liberty, uh, it's something to the effect of bring me your tired, your hungry, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, while Cena rephrases it as bring me, uh, I'm going to be your symbol of opportunity, this is going to be your symbol of opportunity, bring me your outcasts, your underdogs, your future stars, your have-nots, and anybody that the authority ever called a B-plus player. Uh, which, which is good. Um, he says, I will give all of these oddballs a chance. I will be the one to give you a chance when nobody else will. And the John Cena open challenge that happened on Raw will happen every week. And I think that is fucking fantastic. Is he going to squash a bunch of people? Obviously. But when one or two people sneak in and get a really, really good either near victory or victory, the ones that he squashed will make them look good. If he squashes three or four people in three or four weeks, and on the fifth week, Dean Ambrose comes in and takes the title off him, that looks amazing. If Ziggler does the same thing, that will look amazing. If somebody like Cesaro does that, that will look amazing. Um, one or two people are going to get chewed up along the way. That's what happens. You have to have losers in wrestling. Uh, but if this is how it's going to be going forward, that is fucking wonderful. Rusev comes out with Lana, which I found a bit questionable. Uh, says, Mania was a travesty. You're not worthy. You're half the man that Ru you're half the man that Rusev is. Rusev says, I did not lose at Mania. I am still the Russian tank, which kind of came out of nowhere. You're not a hero. You're a coward like the rest of America. This is Rusev's world, and, and at Extreme Rules, I'm coming to get my belt back. Cena says, why don't you try right now? Rusev walks all the way to the ring, doesn't get in, waves the uh, Russian flag around, and he says, this is what you're going to see at Extreme Rules, and he puts his hand up in the air where you would expect the big Russian flag to fall from the ceiling like it always does, and, and, and nothing happens, and he says, this is what you're going to see at Extreme Rules, and he does it again, and... Cena starts mocking him a little bit because it is Cena and that is what he does. He says, oh, you mean this is what's going to happen at Extreme Rules? And big, gigantic, red, white, and blue American flag comes down to end off the segment. And and good for him. He got to have a little victory speech. He got to, at least in kayfabe, at least in, in, in character-wise, uh, talk about how he wants to empower the rest of the roster and give opportunities where there haven't been. I mean, he started that last year with Daniel Bryan, giving Daniel Bryan a title match for, let's face it, really no reason. Um, it's good. We're going to have a great match at Extreme Rules. I hope it is an Extreme Rules match or something like that. I hope it's not a flag match. Can I just put that out there right now? I hope it's not a flag match because that is too cliche. But a, a no holds barred or even a, or even a ladder match. I would be intrigued. I'm not saying that it would necessarily be good, but I'm intrigued at what Rusev and uh, and Cena could do in a ladder match. I think it could be interesting. I'm not saying it'll be good. I'm just saying it could be interesting. Luke Harper versus Dean Ambrose comes about, and I didn't mention this earlier, but Ambrose, for reasons unknown to any one of us, decided to use the authorities' executive bathroom and made it stink. So poopy jokes. All right. But Kane gets pissed off because he's already having a bad night after being made fun of by Randy Orton. He says, you think you're funny. You know, this is this is my area. This is my whatever, whatever. Let me show you how authoritative I am. You're facing Luke Harper tonight. Fantastic. They start throwing punches. And uh, and as, as, you, as you would imagine that Luke Harper and Ambrose would start throwing punches, uh, Ambrose corners... Uh, Harper in the corner with clotheslines and elbows and low clotheslines and Byron Saxton has the quote of the night when he says this match is like watching chaos and anarchy go on a blind date <laughs> I Byron Saxton's got some got some good shit sometimes sometimes back to trading punches and a mud hole stomp by Harper boots and chops by Ambrose fall away slam completely out of the ring on Ambrose by Harper we go to commercial break we come back from commercial break and Harper is biting Ambrose's head because it's Harper Ambrose hits a suicide dive to Harper on the outside top rope elbow by Ambrose gets him a near fall a boot by Harper Harper is dumped out of the ring once again by Ambrose Ambrose is kicked out into the timekeeper's area, hits an elbow drop on Harper off the rail, kind of like a modified version of the rail runner that Jeff Hardy used to do, which is nice. Ambrose eats post, spine first, 
twice, which is nice. Harper power bombs Ambrose through the commentator's desk, and the match ends in a no contest because we go to commercial break and there's completely unrelated stuff happening when we get back. The main event is the newly heel Sheamus versus Daniel Bryan. Sheamus does, I, I think it was good Mike work that said the only thing we need to do now with Sheamus is give him new music. They gave him new, intense, so still sort of got that Irish feel to it, but intense, deeper, slower, not fun music. It starts off all dark with nothing but his video on, and then it they leave the arena dark and there's just a spotlight just on him, and it's very, very effective. I mean, it's totally outdone by the fact that he's still got the braids in his beard and the fucking, you know, Shannon Moore mohawk going on, but it's good. He comes out and cuts a promo that's better than anything I would expect coming out of Seamus, and it's a typical idea, but he delivers it well. He's like, where have all the real men gone? You got all these little grapplers, all these little B-plus players, all these little runts, all these little show-offs, all these little pretty boys running around, and they're trying so hard, but where are all the real men? You cheer for all these guys, but look at them. How can you expect them to be successful? How dare you, the audience, be disappointed in them for failing? Look at them. I'm not here to be your friend. I'm not here to put smiles on your faces. I'm just here to kill all your heroes and shatter all your dreams. That is fucking wonderful. Especially for somebody that's about to face Daniel Bryan. He starts the match off immediately by powering Bryan into the corner. Punches, kicks, and stomps, obliterating him in the corner from the word go. Of course, Daniel Bryan comes back with say it loud and say it proud, because we're going to say it a lot in this match. The Daniel Bryan silly kicks. Oh, yes. Sheamus puts a stop to that with a really big clothesline and multiple cuts. Somewhere in my head, i got to think that he and Wade Barrett are just competing with Cesaro for who can do the most uppercuts in a week. Knees and punches to the gut by Sheamus. Sheamus works over Daniel Bryan's midsection a lot. Mudhole stomps by Sheamus and springs up like a pimple on prom night. More Daniel Bryan silly kicks. Bryan works on Sheamus' ankle for a minute. Sheamus bails, shakes it off, and walks into more Daniel Bryan silly kicks. Backbreaker by Sheamus and we go to commercial break. Sheamus comes back after the break with more knees to the gut, more kicks to the gut, knees to Brian's torso. Um, as I said in the NXT uh, stuff earlier on with the with the dropping of the knees, except it's, this time it's not to the head, it's to the shoulder, it's to the torso, it's to the chest, everything is all good, we're all working on the chest, and then he pulls something right out of freaking Gladiator, he turns to the crowd and says, are you not entertained? Which made me smile. Vertical suplex drop. Um, on Brian, and he does it twice. He doesn't, like, bring him up for the vertical suplex and fall back. He basically brings him up for the ver vertical suplex, stays standing, and lets him fall in a really, really awkward way, and the more awkward it looks, the more painful it looks, and that is great, because it looks like he's just throwing him around. Um, he elbows Brian in the corner once again and stands on Brian's head, sort of Daniel Bryan's face down on the bottom turnbuckle, stands on his head, which is nice. Bitch slaps Brian over and over and over again while he's got him pinned in the corner. Daniel Bryan hits one little bullshit flurry and dumps Sheamus out of the ring. Um, suicide dive by Daniel Bryan, a drop kick by Daniel Bryan, and say it one more time with me, the Daniel Bryan silly kicks. Daniel Bryan gets crossed on the top rope, um, sort of a, a, a tossing neck breaker type maneuver by Sheamus. At this point, the commentators are saying Sheamus made good use of his time away and he's learned a lot and he's added a lot to his arsenal, which is great because this match definitely proves it. Uh, he goes for the 10 beats of the Bowerin on the apron. He gets up to about three or four. They struggle on the apron, but he tosses Brian off of the apron into the commentator's table, which busts Brian open, which is wonderful. At which point, Wade Barrett, who has been doing commentary the whole time, and doing a really, really good job of it, I will add, uh, gets up while the referee's not looking, blasts Brian with the bull hammer. Sheamus goes to pull him back in the ring and then just says, fuck it, you know, rolls back in the ring with a big sly smile on his face and takes the count out victory with Daniel Bryan's, the blood from Daniel Bryan's forehead smeared across his chest. It's a great image to end the show, especially with, you know, him being the great white and then, you know, the crimson mask and all those cliches. Fantastic match. Fantastic SmackDown. I could have done without the Divas match. Uh, I could have done without uh, Dillinger and Jordan on NXT. But other than that, there wasn't much bad. Even Cena and Sheamus are impressing me on this show. We're building contenders. 
for all the titles. We've got a couple of contenders for Brian. We've got a contender for Cena. We've got a couple of contenders for Rollins. We've got a couple of contenders for Kevin Owens. We're building all kinds of stories going forward. And let's the scary thing about this is we're doing all this build on these two shows, and guys, neither one of these shows is even the flagship show. This is good positive shit going forward. Guys, I really hope you enjoy this series. I hope this series goes as well as I think you do. Toss it down in the box below. Tell me what you think of the fights on Friday night, but I gotta get out of here because I gotta sleep. Three videos in three days. I think I've given you a combined five hours of content or something like that to listen to. Go back and listen to this month's Ask the Phoenix. Go back and listen to my WrestleMania and Raw thoughts. But until next time, which will probably be Friday, I've been Spaz, your YWC reality check. Subscribe up there, talk down there, start a conversation, keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I'll talk to each and every last one of you later, but for right now, I'm tagging out. Bye, guys. Like me.